Can you say something about the tension in the work between a kind of optimism and pessimism? And there are some aspects of the, some images, like the wind farm in that one over there, or the, you know, the morning in America and the, the rainbow, etc., which suggests that this, is, that this kind of environment is progressive in some way. Uh, but there, there are other images where, which seem slightly more catastrophic, like the one uh, in the opening gallery with the fires. Mm -hmm. And what did it mean to, to have this balance in, in the project as a whole? Well, I think that, you know, I'm trying to deal with the presence in these images, whereas a lot of times the specific source is somehow historical and my work previous to this. And so these are basically signifiers of where we are today. And I think um, um, one of the issues is, of course, environmental. And, um, you know, we have wind farms all over the place now. It's just one of those things you see are solar panels. And, but it's not necessarily going to solve all our problems, you know. That, that, um, so, I suppose with the last series, this the image on the left is kind of set up for the fire in the next room, um, and I, I was trying to <clears throat> make it a little bit less uh, assimilable or under or um, make it a little bit less able to pigeonhole in terms of its meaning. I, I wanted to create an atmosphere of, uh, that suggested community and uh, what remains of a civic space, which in this case is an athletic field, shared social activity and um, relationship and a, you know, what might be felt as an ideal. You know, I'm not trying you know, it's a matter of balance, I suppose. And so, the windmills and the solar panels are simply part of our world today. It's not, um, but, but at the same time, set the stage for um, the image in the other room, I guess. Um, so, to suggest a certain latent um, threat, I suppose. And, uh, anticipation. Uh, and this is the piece where the um, the words of him that you've chosen, chosen as the title of the show, Credit, Faith, Trust, that's some kind of, again, optimistic, but at the same time menacing terms, the, the way that they're presented there. Yeah. You're I, I have, kind of yeah. Logo. And it's funny, when I said I'm not really interested in narrative, now I'm describing kind of a narrative yes. relationship between the images. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I was trying to think of just sponsors, you know, for the athletic field. There's always a corporate sponsor, and it's all, you know, their logos. So um, Credit Faith Trust became the, um, <clears throat> the. Is that something you found, or is it is it the logo of a bank? Or no, it's not. I had to. You made it up. Work around <laughs> all the banks that are called, you know, Federal Credit Union. Reliable trusts, you know, all those different. So it was a combination that I uh, put together myself. This is it's an it's ironic comment on, on the on the confidence that a lot of the, these names give, you know, mutual and trust and so on and so forth. And of course, that's what's gone wrong because the trust disappeared. Yeah, exactly. But so. I think the most interesting thing you say about these, and it's, it, it is something new in your work, is that it is about now, and is it the now of the past, or is it now, is it, is it part of the now of the past, or part of the now of the future, and that's, that's uh, left, left for you to, as an ambiguity, a very interesting ambiguity, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the period when, when people are talking about how the world is just not going to be the same, a lot of the things that work won't work, a lot of the things that uh, are new to us, will become very commonplace. And uh, it, it's a very, very interesting time we're living through. And I think this is, this is about that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, another thing I think that makes them very contemporary, and we were talking a bit about this before, is uh, how they connect to other representations of this kind of landscape or this kind of community. 
at the moment, whether it's Jonathan Franzen's novel um, Freedom and the, the way in which that, this sort of community is written about in his novels, or uh, you know, some of the American TV programs that no longer present an idealistic picture of suburbia, but that show it as a place full of deception and lack of faith or lack of credit. I'm thinking of, well, the, the way in which uh, outside of New York is shown in Mad Men. I know that's a, 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 a show about the 60s, but still the way in which suburbia comes across there reminds me a little bit of, of, of these works. Did you, you know, when you started making work, you were very conscious of its difference to the way in which TV represented domestic spaces. Uh, and it was a counter, a counter voice to that idealizing kind of moment in American pop culture. But now, now there's more commonality, I think. Do you recognize that, or is it something that's interesting to you? Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Um, I don't think I was uh, referencing those things directly, but in you know contemporary television and pop culture. But um, I do feel the um, uh, affinity, I guess, with. Uh, well, you know, they do feel pop to me on some level. You know, yeah. so they relate to popular culture in that way. Um, but you've gone direct to the point of reference by looking at these kind of negatives rather than using the media mm -hmm. as, That's as something to mediate. You're thinking about these works, which I think makes, is what makes them so powerful and, and uh, makes them feel that, like they're, they're, they're a world that you, you haven't really it's, it's all too familiar, familiar but the, the sweet and sourness of them is exaggerated. Mm -hmm. um, can I, yeah, can I ask a, a couple of more like art historical questions, which um, about your relationship to an earlier generation? I mean, at the point where your work began, mm -hmm. um, it was in the mid to late seventies, and two of the works that are my favourite works from that period are the Gordon Matter Clark splitting, which were was to take a house from a place in New Jersey and to split it. Uh, and Dan Graham's alteration to a suburban house where he imagines replacing the, the front window with a mirror. Um, now, uh, so it was a focus, suburbia and um, architecture was a focus of that generation. Um, your generation took that interest in different ways. How would you articulate the, the different interests or the connections? Well, you know, I always <coughs> felt like I had a lot in common with both of them. And, you know, uh, Gordon Meadow Clark was a big um, kind of early influence, really. I mean, I thought a lot about the, his whole generation of artists. And um, moving to New York when I did, um, one of the first projects I did was to um, do this installation of light, commercial style light boxes in a um, in the ferry terminal, Staten Island ferry terminal. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of anonymously placed these, un these unidentified, enigmatic black and white images of imaginary spaces amongst the advertising in this room, through which like seventy thousand people a day passed to get to and from the city, and you know my. My reference was really Gordon Matt Clark in terms of how he dealt with sort of edge spaces of the city and altered the actual fabric of the, the structures there that he found there. But um, yeah, um, and Dan Graham too was one of the few artists that I knew who, of, well, who was thinking along these same lines in terms of architecture and writing about it. In fact, um, at that point in time, so I. I um, I was thinking about the same things, I must say. The relationship between architecture and the visual arts, the nature of public space. The, um, um, but you, you, yeah. you moved those interests away from, um, well, away from real interventions with actual architecture yeah. uh, towards this realm of the imaginary. Um, yeah. and making pictures which are on the cusp between the fictional and, and 
and the real. And, and what, you know, why did you think that became urgent at that point? <clears throat> well, I think, you know, I looked at, um, well, I guess I looked at the way artists were using photography in different ways, uh, you know, outside the fine art photography context, whether as inserts in magazines, newspapers. Uh, didn't Dan do a project where he was using the pages of a magazine? Yeah, that's um, Homes for America. That is which Homes for America. Sort of yeah. Maybe the first artistic reaction to kind of American suburbia. Well, not the first, but you know, one of the most important. But I, you know, I was just I was interested in the way photographs are distributed and used in advertising and at large, I guess, in outside the limited context of an art gallery. And um, so it was. Part of that, I guess, part of my generation's sort of move to expand the audience beyond what we at the time felt was the more limited audience for conceptual art. Um, but it was also building on sort of the, all the work of the, you know, <coughs> installation artists who documented temporary installations and events. Could you, could you yeah. so talk, talk about what you feel your relationship to conceptual art is? Because that's in a way what attracted me to your work. Um, God, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, how to answer it, you know? Because um, it has many, you know, conceptual art has many definitions, I suppose. Um, would, uh, yeah. would you would you say that in a sense, because you you, you were you were too young to be part of that generation, but you, grew, you, 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 you must have cut your teeth as an artist being aware of it, as you yeah, described yeah, yeah. Graham and, and, and Gordon Mike Clark. And uh, <coughs> it seems to me that this kind of way of thinking, mm -hmm. which is also in your work, and there are all different ways of thinking. Uh, uh, people talk a lot about post-conceptual or how, you know, it's, it's, it's it becomes again and again by people in the tale because it comes back again and again, referencing back to these artists mm -hmm. uh, with, with uh, subsequent generations of artists. And uh, I think you're the generation that, that, that actually had to confront that. Um. Well, um, and then okay. each generation of artists has to confront the generation before yeah. uh, and either take it on board or reject it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, you know, the history of this gallery has been very much based on that. Um, like from minimum, minimum conceptual art to the British sculptors, who were kind of rejecting a lot of things about sculpture. And they, they actually made some very valid progress there. Um, mm -hmm. in, 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 in not only in formal terms, but bringing the idea of metaphor back. So, in a sense, you're bringing the idea of metaphor back as well, in yeah. that sense. So you have something in common there. Yeah, that's, um, that's true. I mean, I really, um, you know, I work with people like Baldessari and Doug Kubler and Michael Asher and other conceptual artists in graduate school. I mean, you know, um, so that's kind of the concept uh, coming out of. So I think um, there was a, Certainly in Baldessari, there's a certain humor to what he does that he brought to conceptual art, I think. And, um, um, but again, there was this return to some kind of studio practice that was shared amongst my peers. And um, you know, I went to school with Mike Kelly and Tony Ausler and John Miller, and there was still this desire to do something that was very um, multidisciplinary, conceptual, but um, that actually addressed the psyche, you know, and your emotions and, and pop popular culture, or um, in, let's say, Mike's case, sort of an underbelly of American culture, or, you know. So we kind of tried to take on the, 
the vernacular in different ways, I suppose, in different subjects that were outside the realm of maybe the purely, the more pure philosophical context that some conceptual art might be seen in. You know, like even, I mean, I guess I'm reminded a little bit of this chain when I think, I mean, Dan was here the other day, and we were talking, and you know, he mentioned Bastian, or what's his name, Bastian Otter. And the emotion, you know, the pathos that they, he brought to his work as a conceptual artist was shared by people like um, David Askewold and Mike Kelly and so forth. So there was this attempt to deal with, you know, your own dysfunction, I guess, and anxiety. And I think that's what I share with some of those, with, you know, people like Mike, I guess. You know, it might be in a very, very different way, but. Um, uh, but there, you know, there is a there is a train of thought that comes in Something that way. Maybe that route. relevant. Uh, you mentioned when we were looking around the show earlier, and sort of surprisingly, and thought of it before that you you were kind of observing. I don't know for the first time, or you thought of it previously that your work uh, reminded you of the, the feel of certain animations, and that seemed yeah. quite pertinent. And I was looking uh, this really good essay on animation by. Austrian writer called Richard Weyer, and he said, the animation film is not an interpretation of dreams from the perspective of Freud and reality, but rather an interpretation of reality from the perspective of the dream. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something to do with what we're talking about, that it's mm -hmm. like you, mm -hmm. you know, you've got a process not of critiquing a reality, but of sort of sucking that reality into this whole worldview that you make by the artifice mm -hmm. of your, you know, your way of working. Yeah, that seems very appropriate, yeah. actually. I mean, I guess, these are not really, they're not about reality, they are about ideas, or the, rather than things themselves, I think. That makes sense. You know, I guess my reference, which might be a little bit out of the blue, is Gregory Bateson, who was this information theory, multidisciplinary thinker from California who had left to do with cybernetics, and very anthropologist, married to Margaret Mead. Anyway, he wrote a lot about um, schizophrenia and I mean, he did research in the South Pacific, but um, anyway, um, what, why am I bringing him up? It's just the idea that it's about, it's, it's not about reality, it's about the relationships between, about ideas. That makes, it made me too, too broad. Could you say something about the, um, just drawing from one thing from Andrew's comment about the uh, uh, sort of after production, um, Adaptation, digital adaptations of your works, because yeah, I believe that you use that. You've always kind of tweaked, but it's more like a creative uh, act now, mm -hmm. isn't it? In these works, more intervention. Yeah, there's a, there is a lot more digital work that's done on these, and um, you know, I kind of came at it backwards, just because as the industry changed, it became necessary to print digitally. So instead of burning and dodging in a dark room. Um, it was done in Photoshop, and so as as the work, I guess, got more complicated, the digital work got more complicated too. So, um, it, I, you know, it wasn't really a conscious decision, I think. Um, but with the first of these models, um, we did everything we possibly could to shoot what we thought would be close to the finished results. But when we got the negative back, or the chrome in this case, you know, we could look at it and say, all right, we don't need to shoot anymore. We can do this on screen. And so there was a lot of work that, you know, was done as a result. And it's continued to be the case with these so that um, we, you know, we try to make them as close as possible. But with a model of this scale, you know, every tree had to be straightened, every house. You know, the first thing we do is just, you know, I've got somebody that goes over the whole thing and straightens every wall, every vertical, and every horizontal, and, uh, so it had you know. to be Well, it doesn't have to be. It could have been why, left why? just as crude as it was, but yeah. there, you know, there was a certain balance, I guess, that I'm after in terms of, you know, visually, and... Um, At what point did you decide to emphasis. print on this scale to, to, make, to make them like this size? This large? Well, I've been printing this relative size for some time, actually, yeah. and probably, you know, things got gradually larger as they sometimes do, but, um, you know, 
previous show, we had works that were larger than this, actually. They were generally um, maybe 8 by 10 or 12 feet in some cases. So. Um, something else I want to ask, I mean, you've, you've worked in series. At what point do you work out that the series is finished? And I first saw a couple of these works at the Whitney, and now obviously the series has extended and complicated. We have the image of the fire. Do you, do you, is the model still in your studio? Do you, is there more to come from this kind of um, imagery? Well, the model is still in my studio. Um, the last image to be shot was the small one in the other room with the house and the land in the foreground, the vertical image with the fire. But um, uh, so, you know, exhibitions have a way of being, you know, changing points, I guess. And in this case, um, I, well, I, I, I liked working on the smaller scale and the more limited, faster pace. And so um, we'll see. There's, there may be a couple more um, images with this godlike overview, and um, um, but I'd like to work on smaller, simpler images at the moment. See my results more quickly. That kind of thing. Did you have fun making the models? Did you actually enjoy it, or was it simply a process? Um, yeah, I had fun. I had fun. Um, Did you make models as a kid? Not very much. I mean, I really, honestly, never really had much of an attachment to working in miniature. So I, mm -hmm. I, I always, when I visited your studio, I was, I think I talked to you about it on one or two occasions, that it must have been fun making it. Because um, you're creating your own, your own fantasy world, and you are, in a way, you're playing God. simulator of reality? Well, you know, it's now it's more about working with people and, um, you know, working out all the steps. And it's a much more complicated planned process. So, I mean, probably the most fun is actually shooting it when you're, when you've got it to that point where the lights are there and, the, what, you know, and it's... And that's the other thing that struck yeah. me is that it's almost like a film production. You're building a film set, essentially. Mm -hmm. And you're using a lot of the techniques of creating a film, set, film set and, and, and shooting it. So yeah, kind of old-fashioned film set. That's mm -hmm. kind of old-fashioned. It's not entirely digital animation at this stage, no. But with the fire, we did rent, um, you know, film, uh, fire, fire gels, and um, bars to place behind the model from a special effects company that does this for movies, basically. So it you know, got very dramatic, and it was a lot of fun, actually. 